and these are things that come straight from my heart. I'm not. I was today praying with um, with the sunset, and at the net, it's a beautiful kind of time. Like the world is is a good place, and a Kaddish Baruch kind of, you know, you feel a little bit more in touch. All these books that were here on the table before, they, we moved them to the side. Those were all books of Rabbi Uziel, who was one of the giant thinkers of the Jewish world in the early years of the State of Israel and before that. The prayer for the State of Israel that we say on Shabbat, he wrote it. He was chief rabbi. He was chief rabbi. chief rabbi in Israel. He, he was uh, actually, interestingly enough, listen to this, 1948, when the State of Israel was established, he was unanimously chosen. He should not voted. There were no elections, no politics, no you know, Knesset members that put in their bids for chief rabbi. He was chosen by the entire country, from the most secular to the most uh, religious, as the chief rabbi of Israel. It was a special personality. And for whatever reason, I know the reason, he has pretty much disappeared from Jewish consciousness. And he's not the only one. He's not the first person, he's not the last person. You know, I have today some 26 books of Ravuzio. There are 10 more that I wasn't able to get my hands on, but all the time I hope that over time I'll be able to get my hands on them. Ravuzio fought against the establishment on certain core issues that were very important issues. First and foremost, Ravuzio fought about conversion. Ravuziel was the flag of not making conversion so difficult. Especially in situations where people were already in relationships with Jews, or had children with a Jewish man or a Jewish woman. Ravuziel felt that in those situations you have a responsibility. Someone's already part of our people, whether you like it or not. <coughs> and what, what's going to happen if you keep pushing them and pushing them and pushing them? So that guy who wasn't so affiliated in the first place, and that's why he married somebody not Jewish, is just going to leave Judaism and stay with his wife who he loves more than he loves you, the Beidin. Uh, that's probably the relationship that's going on. And Rav Uziel felt that by pushing people away from Hashem, you're not doing the Jewish people a favor. It doesn't mean that we have everyone who comes in the door, we let them in. It's also not true. But not to be, you don't have to be mean. It doesn't have to be hurtful. It just has to be a process that's rigorous, but not, not damaging. And Rav Kook was the opponent to his opinion. Even though him and Rav Kook were best friends, they were chief rabbis together, Rav Kook felt that according to Kabbalah, what a person has to go through to become Jewish is, is a, it's, it's a complete transformation of their soul. And he proved that according to Kabbalah, he was right. And Rav Uziel wrote him a famous letter. And he said, with all due respect to Rav Kook, you don't deal with halakha from a Kabbalistic point of view. Mm. And when you're dealing with people's lives and their families, you don't throw Kabbalah at them. You use halakha. Halakha is the only thing that we have that's solid. Kabbalah, sure, on a Kabbalistic level, many things have to happen. And that's our hope, it will happen. But Halakha has to be our determining factor, not Kabbalah. And I've seen that the Jewish world, we get swept away by certain things. that are Kabbalistic trends, or Kabbalistic, and we're not against Kabbalah. But the question is, when did Kabbalah take, take over the Tanakh? When did Kabbalah take over, over our Halakha? When did Kabbalah become the staple of Judaism? And it's interesting, it's just now we had a question. I'll tell you, not just now. We had somebody in my house who's been part of the Jewish community for many years. And she's not actually Jewish herself. But she's not going anywhere. And she's not sure if she wants to convert. She had a very bad experience trying to convert the first time around. But the worst part was a rabbi who had told her that he asked her to do something. I don't know if he was a rabbi. He was like a spiritual mentor. Um, I mean, it wasn't a rabbi. Tell him he's not a rabbi. And, <laughs> and he told her... Young Jew. <laughs> to do something that was uh, a terrible thing. And, and then his justification was, he said to her in her face, well, anyways, according to the Zohar, you don't have a soul. <laughs> so when I hear something like that, like treat like an animal. that's, that that's the antithesis of what, of what Judaism is. But I'll tell you the truth. If you open up some works of you Kabbalah... You have world opinion, but a lot of people challenge this concept. This concept. Well, I, I'm sure, and I'm sure that I could do it with you. I can bring to you a number of Kabbalistic texts that will mention this kind of soul and that kind of soul and the third kind of soul. And well, my answer to that is, what do you know about souls? Mm -hmm. Shlomo Kabach was once in the. He used to teach a class in the Diamond District, and I read this story by. There's a book by Yaffa Halberstam. It's called. I'll tell you. Um, Holy brother. That was the name oh, in Hebrew. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I read it in Hebrew. In Hebrew it's called Harabi Mikeren Achov. Literally the rabbi from the street corner. That was uh, 
That was how Rav Shlomo was known in the Hebrew-speaking circles. And Rav Shlomo was giving a class in the Diamond District to very professional people. Now one of the businessmen afterwards pulled him aside and said, Rabbi, we love you very much. We're struggling with you very much too. How do you hang out with such strange people? Like all these weirdos and you're hugging homeless people in Central Park and you're all over the news and it doesn't do well for our, our, our lifestyle when you dabble with us and you dabble with them. So why do you have to do that to yourself? <clears throat> and Shlomo Kabbach looked at the guy and said, you know, tell me about your diamonds. When you get them, what do they look like? He said, they're dirty, they're full of mud. So how do you know not to throw them in the garbage? He said, I'm not a diamond dealer. He said, I know that if you polish them well enough, they'll become sparkling diamonds. So Shlomo told him, listen, if I would have seen one of your diamonds when they came into the store, I would have thrown them to the garbage. <coughs> For the reason? I'm not a diamond dealer. He said, but I'm a soul dealer. He said, and you are just a diamond dealer. So when I see souls and all you see is mud, you have to know that I know there's a diamond inside. Mm-hmm. You don't know that. I don't expect you to know that. But don't tell me that I should throw souls to the side because right now they're covered in mud. <laughs> I don't know what souls are and I don't know what souls mean, but I know that when you read a Kabbalistic term in a text in a very childish manner, you're going to come out with a very childish concept. To what the Mekubalim were trying to get to is not at all what people are using these texts to me. I'm that of that, I'm sure. Absolutely. Somebody asked me the question, where is the soul? The head, the heart, the heart, the heart. What do you tell them? I don't know the answer to that answer. I guess some people it's in their wallet, some people it's in their... See, that's the problem, is we're reading these texts in a juvenile fashion. But I've seen stuff in children's books. I saw it in one school. I, I, like they're teaching Tanya to like, you know, first grade and talking about how non-Jews don't have souls and mm-hmm. Jews have yeah. souls. And that is pretty dangerous. I mean, for an adult... Why is a first grader... I'm not a Chabanik, so I don't no. know. But why, why is a first grader... Why, why is a first grader learning a complex Kabbalistic work? He hasn't finished the Parsha yet. He doesn't know how to translate Hebrew. What's he doing learning Kabbalah? That's, that's the problem. That, so this is exactly what I'm talking about. Rav Uziel saw this obsession with, with Kabbalistic things as holding the Jewish people back right. in a progressive realm. Then there was a second question that came up in Israel. And that question was one of autopsies. You need to train doctors for the new state of Israel. And the question is, are you allowed to perform an autopsy on, on Jewish cadavers? And Rav Cook said, absolutely not. Like most people in the street that they think. <laughs> Rav Kook said in the mood that taking apart a human body is, is, of a Jew is what's called nivul hamit. It's, it's de- desecrating a human body. And we're not allowed to do such things. And what was Rav Kook's suggestion? Rav Kook's suggestion was to find non-Jews who had donated their bodies to science and the Jewish doctor should practice on non-Jewish bodies. Because by non-Jewish bodies... Unlike Jews who have a Torah that they can't choose whether or not they want to follow, by non-Jews they could choose that this for me is not desecrating my body. I want my body to be used in such a fashion. So Rav Uziel heard of this and he put another letter out. And Rav Uziel said, I don't understand. It was bad enough that you said such a thing. But now that you put it into writing, do you know how dangerous that is? So what's going to happen now when somebody comes along to, oh look, the chief rabbi of the Jews, he says the non-Jewish bodies you can cut open and study them in laboratories. But Jewish bodies, no, we don't do that. No, but that's if they allow it to be donated. Absolutely, but it's, it's, it was the matter of putting a Jew and a non-Jew in two different that's standards. And, and this, might, it's, you know, it's, uh, this happened now. There's a, famous, there's a famous chief rabbi that the English-speaking world is obsessed with. Yeah. They're obsessed with him because he's a good author, but yeah. it's not a posseik. That is his problem. And he was giving a conference in Jerusalem. And somebody asked him about donating organs to people to save their lives. And he said, we can accept organs from non-Jews, but we can't give organs to non-Jews. Mm-hmm. Rabbi Moshe Tendler in, in New York gave a similar response to Rabbi Uzziah. You either don't take organs at all, and therefore you don't give organs at all, or you take organs and you give organs. There's no, there's no option of, I don't do this and I do that. And he said, what kind of opinion is that? There's no halachic source for saying that a Jew and a non-Jew have two different standards of whose life is more important. 
And this is what Rav Uziel said. Rav Uziel penned a letter in which he said that all human beings have a basic humanity first. And that basic humanity cannot be desecrated on any level. And if we can prove, and he did prove, that do, performing an autopsy in order to study medicine to save another person's life, if that's what it requires to save another person's life, that's allowed to be done even on a Jewish body. And if you feel that it cannot be done on a Jewish body, it also cannot be done on a non-Jewish body. Because he said Hashem, when he created the world, it says in the Torah, that Hashem breathed into Adam, Nishmat Chaim, a soul. And this is very interesting, because how this goes with those Kabbalistic texts. He said, before there were Jewish people, before there was Moshe Rabbeinu, Hashem created all of humanity with the Nishmat Chaim. He said, and therefore, you can't come to me today and say that a Jew has a different soul than a non-Jew. He said, because the Torah argues with you. So that very idea, powerful. Like, very that powerful. idea that's actually that absolutely pervasive. Well, 180 I degrees. Mean, it's part of our situation as Jews. That a non-Jew absolutely. is different. The Jew is at a higher. This has a higher soul. You know, and it's a very dangerous idea. Rav Uziel argues at its core mm-hmm. that it's not true according to the Torah. The to- look, the Torah says, open up a chumash. The Torah says Hashem created man, in human, and breathed into them Nishmat Chaim and created them in His image. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't say again there was a second creation of Jews where mm-hmm. He breathed into them a new soul. Mm-hmm. And the- mm-hmm. So Rav says, your, your understanding of Jews and non-Jews is flawed. And he told Rav Kook that he begs him to retract his opinion. Is that an opinion from Halak, um, from Kabbalah? It's a, it's a, it comes from a... Rav Uziel was also a Kabbalist. Rav Uziel said, I refuse to accept certain things in Kabbalah if they argue against what we know as fact from Torah. in the Torah. Right, exactly. There was a famous rabbi in Israel who got in big trouble because he said the Jewish blood was more precious than Arab blood. Yeah. Very big news. So clearly, the door is a revolving door and you just have new names filling it. Mm-hmm. Now, Rav Kook, God forbid, I'm not saying anything bad about Rav Kook. Right. But Rav Kook... He was a Kabbalist and, and very much driven by his, his Kabbalistic side as well as his... He was a Jewish nationalist. Mm-hmm. Rav Uzel didn't approach Israel as a, a political agenda. I actually just have a book now I'm reading. Rav Uzel's plans for Arabs to have their own government also. Because how could a Jew have courts where they're judging Muslims if Muslims need to be judged based on Muslim law? And I haven't finished his essay on this matter yet. But Rav Uzel, he didn't think from the same perspective that was in a box. You have to be a certain way. And your answers have to come out in a certain way. There was a third issue that Rav Uziel, These became the three flagship issues in Israel. The third issue Rav Uziel argued with Rav Kook about <clears throat> was whether ladies have a right to vote. This is the 19... I'll tell you when. They were fighting about the 19, 1919, 1920. Mm-hmm. If I'm not mistaken, that's almost parallel to the women's suffrage movement in Britain. And Israel at the time was a British colony. It was Mm -hmm. taken over by the British. So anything that was happening politically in England was happening also in Israel. And these new Moshavim were consulting the chief rabbi. So what do we do? What is the halachic standard for a lady? Can she vote? And then on top of that, can she be a judge? So Rav Kook wrote a letter saying that a lady should not vote. Because there should be one vote per household. The husband and a wife shouldn't have a difference of opinion. So it was motivated by a very strong family. There should be a family vote. That's fair. Yeah. And it was a fair stance. The problem was that the elections weren't run based on families. They were run based on people. And the practical question, so can a lady vote? We need the votes. Rav Cook said no. It violates halakha for a lady to vote. How? We don't know. And Rav Uziel wrote a letter saying... There are no halachot about ladies voting. And if a lady is going to have to live under someone else's government, under someone else's rules, where she is just as, as obliged to follow them as any other man, you cannot tell me that she doesn't have a right to make a decision about her own future. And Rav Uziel pushed this idea that a lady should vote, which interestingly enough, Rav Cook's students accepted, because they had no choice. But Rav Cook didn't. And there was a second argument on the same topic, whether a lady can serve in a government position, <clears throat> such as a judge, or a mayor, or whatever else it was that they needed. And most, and still today, in the Orthodox Jewish camp, <clears throat> most rabbis will pull out a Rambam in the laws of Sanhedrin. But the Rambam says that a lady cannot sit in the Sanhedrin. The reason, because a lady cannot be in a position of authority over another man. Mm-hmm. And they use this, by the way, in all kinds of 
non-related ways. I mean, I've, I've even heard of soldiers in the Israeli army, not from the Haredi camp, by the way, who their rabbis have told them that when their female officer gives them a command, that their friend next to them should repeat it, so they're taking the order from their friend and not from her. Like, like Ad Kadekaf. Now, yeah, yeah. again, I'm not, all, I'm not for lady officers of men. Who gives the order to the friend? So who gives the order to the friend? But these are, these are things that have been taken out of... Now, Moshe Chaim, the first thing, but, but it's not a Sanhedrin we're talking about. We're not talking here about a Sanhedrin. Well, that's an obvious thing to say, right? Rav Uziel had an even stronger rebuttal of this argument. So what is a Sanhedrin? A Sanhedrin is not a democratically elected group. It is a group of people who are the elite of the Jewish scholarly community that rule over the entire country. He said, but in a place where a man says, I want this lady to be my arbitrator, is she halakhically allowed to do that? Rav Uziel said, yes. Yes. He said, because... Rav Uziel said, in this situation, when you have a democracy, and people are voting for somebody, a man can vote and say, I want this lady to be my mayor, I want her to be the governor, I want her to be the judge. And there's no halachic problem with that. So one rabbi wrote a letter against Rav Uziel. That said, but there's an ancient Jewish tradition that says that ladies are not as intelligent as men. <laughs> By the way, oh another, another... Is this married? Another... Yeah. Did you feel married? Why didn't The Gemara, I'll tell you. The Gemara says... No, I'll tell you. I'll tell you exactly what the Gemara says. The Gemara says, Nashim, ladies, Datan Kala. Or Datan Kalo. Depending. Which means, a lady's dat is weak. It's, uh, it's lower than that of a man. And most, oh, yeah, ladies are not so intelligent. But the same Gemara also says, Bina yitera nitna l'nashim. An extra level of Bina was given to ladies. And so essentially these are two statements that cancel each other out. What is the difference between Da'at and Bina? Don't tell me you know, wisdom, knowledge, understanding. I got, <laughs> I got the English translation of the Tanya too. The answer is, we don't really know. We know that a person's intellect is made up of three parts. And all the Talmud is saying is the part that we consider to be that. In a lady, a man has more than a lady. But the part of a man, man's intellect called Bina, a lady has more than him. So just like the Talmud says that a lady is not smart, it says the man's not smart also. Just If you would read it that way, it would... You see that in right. the nature of men and women. Exactly. Women have more of an empathic sense of connecting with something. And men tend to be more well, this is by, some Tracking. some like to explain that yeah. bina is a perception. Mm. It's a perceptive intelligence. You know, like when your wife says, "I don't like, like that person." Mm-hmm. So yeah. I saw them. Yeah. I saw them talking. Something about they them is. And they get up before the men do. <laughs> right? <laughs> but the man, the man well, has a different strong. thing. Yeah. A man, according to this interpretation of the man, again, there are different interpretations of these malot. His logic is a little bit more cold and abrasive, yes. which is that he'll. Well, you see this very often in relationships, when a man decides he wants to get divorced, or doesn't have to do with his wife. He can pull himself into this place where he doesn't have feelings anymore. He doesn't have emotions, he just wants to ruin another person's life. And she is busy, you know, sending flowers and knocking on the door. He doesn't care, he's already closed himself, he made a decision. And some say that this cold decision making is why traditionally men have been Dayanim, for example, judges. Because but what about Sarah and Abraham when she said... Throw Hagar out, mm-hmm. and Abraham said, "No, it's my son." How? But you find you find going to Kabbalistic literature that Sarah is different than most ladies because she she did take a certain leadership position that other ladies didn't do, like Dvora, let's say. That's why she couldn't have children. <laughs> I don't know. You're I don't know about that. Yeah, they explain. It says the, I mean, she was in a certain to... place where she was a greater prophetess than Abraham Avinu right. was. That's what the Talmud tells us. So, you see that a lot of these things, they fit into a certain balance. That when, when he was strong, so she was all kind of, Like you find by Dvorah, that she was a leader, and her husband Barak was and pretty much not close to that. And, and you find there are ladies who fall into that category, and ladies who prefer the Rachel, Rivka kind of model of you know, running the Jewish world, but from inside of the tent, not from outside of the tent. It seems like many rabbis... Are more rather than basing it on ground principle and how they come up with a modern situation, they're blaming more alliterative. 
well, this happened and this is how it was done, but it doesn't necessarily mean that situation is equal, like comparing voting to Sanhedrin, for example. Right. Like the Sanhedrin principle is there, but doesn't really apply to a democratic voting situation. Mm -hmm. but, then they, but still, they use yeah, that as a way to make the decision. Right. Rav Uziel in general, and this is a good point, Rav Uziel in general belongs to a camp of rabbis, who are, no, they're not organized as a camp, just they fit into a certain genre, of rabbis who view the Jewish community and its leadership as, I'm going to say a term and I'll explain it, hashkafically immature. Which means they focus very much on how to understand the Talmud and, and the different Rashis and the Chumash. And they very much know Halachot and, and this and that. But when it comes to, okay, so what's the plan? We're Jews. We're going to have a country. We're going to have a... Who's going to run it? How's it going to work? What are going to be the Halachot? What happens if a person is an observant? Well, you can throw him in jail and stone him to death. Like what, what's it going to look like if we actually put all this 2,000 years of exile into practice? And Rav Uziel belonged to a camp of, of hashkafically mature rabbis who said, listen, this is a reality we're dealing with. The reality is different than what you read about in the book. And, and we're not progressive, we're not feminists, we're, not, we're just dealing with halachic realities that are different than that which the rabbis before us dealt with. Other rabbis, though, are not as hashkafically mature. Rabbi, Rabbi Eliezer Waldenberg, have you heard of his name? Mm -hmm. The Tzitz Eliezer. He was the chief rabbi of the Shari Tzedek Hospital. He wrote a book, Tzitz Eliezer. You'll see him quoted a lot, Tzitz Eliezer. He, I have his, see those blue books on the, uh, I guess, the second shelf down, blue books to the right, there are a bunch of brown books. He wrote that whole series, it's some 27 volumes put into 13 books. He wrote another book called um, The Laws of Government, which is his magnum opus of how is an Israeli government going to function as a democratic religious government. And unfortunately this book was printed, not unfortunately, but his children and his students begged for it to not be printed because it made the rabbi look like a Zionist and they had a big problem with that. But uh, he lays out a plan. He was from the Hashkafically mature camp. Why am I telling you all about Rabbi Uziel? I'll tell you why I'm telling you about it. How many of you heard of Rav Kook before? How many of you own a book of Rav Kook? About Rav Kook? How many of you have read something from Rav Kook? How many of you read something from Rabbi Uziel? How many of you own a book from Rabbi Uziel? Anything in English? I don't know. I don't. Uh, yeah, Rabbi Angel wrote a biography about him. Oh, yeah. I have. I have it actually here. If someone wants to borrow. Talking about him from you. From yeah, us. That's yeah. how he yeah. fought for Rav Kook. Right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, those, uh, he fought for Rav Kook. I mean, they were best friends. They argued, but they were. Satmar, right. Yeah. Rabbi Uziel was just as, if not even more, influential than Rav Kook on the Orthodox Jewish community. <laughs> the reason is that he was much more mainstream than Rav Kook. But the mainstream Jewish groups that came after him edited him out of history. Because he doesn't fit the agenda that we're trying to pass off to the Jewish world today. And so where in some circles Rav Kook is becoming more and more, you know, acceptable, you can learn certain books of his, you can learn... Rav Uziel, he's forgotten. There's only one place that prints his books. I just bought the last set of books from Rav Uziel. This man is very old and he told me he's never going to print Rav Uziel's books again. We're dealing with the reality that there are rabbis that are disappearing right. in Jewish history before our eyes. Rav Yosef Mashash, Rabbi Shalom Mashash, rabbis that are gone. They're gone. They're, they're, they're not going to go anywhere. And I'm telling you that we're doing our hardest here. Look, Rabbi Avram Ben Rabbi, let's talk about a book. This book was a staple of Sephardic Jewry for 2,000 years. Or 1,005, since, since the Rabbi Avram wrote it. It's probably. It's late for him to come. Oh, we're finding that more and more of these rabbis are disappearing. And it's not because they weren't mainstream, they weren't controversial. But today they've become not mainstream and not controversial. <laughs> Rav Avram ben Aramam's book was a staple of Jewish life. It was written in Arabic. And basically when the Sephardic Jews came to Israel, it disappeared, because who reads Arabic? And only a few years ago, Zev, when did you first find this book again? 
this one here. Like five years ago, maybe? Five. Yeah, it's when they reprinted it. So, so, hey, listen, we have a book from the Rambam Sun that's translated into English. But how long are we going to wait for them to do that to all of these rabbis' books? And so I was sitting now with my rabbi in uh, Yerushalayim, my rabbi Rabbi Shushan. And Rabbi Shushan. Yeah, what? Who's yours? Book that oh, you found it. Loving truth and peace. The yes. Religious view of Rabbi Denzio, it did a very good job. I have a copy if you want to borrow. And um, I was sitting with Rabbi Shushan, his name is Giyach, and he special, special rabbi. He's this tall, maybe, but oh. huge in stature. Um, and he's an Israeli war hero. He's an active member of Tzal. And Rav Shushan. When he heard about everything that happened in the last few weeks, Sir so Shushan stood up and he said, Mazal Tov! And he gave me a hug. Mm -hmm. I looked at Rav Shushan and I said, Mazal Tov, I just told you a really sad story. <clears throat> and he hugged me and he said, Welcome to the Major Leagues. <laughs> I said, what are you Major Leagues? He said, until now, clearly what you were teaching wasn't so important. He said, until now, you know, small-time stuff. He said, but now you've joined the ranks of all the rabbis that the Jewish world has wanted to edit out. He said, so I'm pushing you on Mazal Tov. It's a good start. And I thought about it for a second. And I thought, why is the Jewish world editing out people like Rabbi Uziel? Why rabbis like Rabbi Yosef Moshash? Why rabbis like... When I just told you now about the neshama, that all of us have the same neshama. Some of you said, well, that's, that's a very big concept that needs to be heard. But it's a concept that some people don't want to hear. Because it goes against their agenda of let's make a Jewish social club. Let's make a Jewish country club where only we can be a part of it. And let's... let's it hasn't worked so well for us. Rabbi Yosef Mashash, who shows up on the scene and he, he brings such controversial things to the table as discussing that maybe some ladies don't have to cover their hair. Or some places don't need an eruv. Or he became famous for things that weren't his world view, but they were some things that he believed. He was a little bit too Zionist for some of the mainstream, and they edited him out of Jewish history. Rabbi Yosef Mashash was such an influ influential Jewish rabbi. He made Aliyah to Israel from Morocco, chief rabbi. He made Aliyah to Israel. He lived in Haifa. And they wanted him to be the chief rabbi of Haifa. This is right after the founding of the state of Israel, 1950s. And he didn't want the position. He said it's not his style to be the rabbi of people who don't want him to be the rabbi. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, Haifa is not exactly the place that's looking for a chief rabbi. You have to hear what happened. <clears throat> David Ben-Gurion comes from, I guess he was in Tel Aviv or Yerushalayim, I don't know where he was. Travels up to Haifa and personally meets Rabbi Yosef Mashash and begs him, he says, I'm not leaving your office until you agree to be the chief rabbi of Haifa. Imagine what kind of chief rabbi David Ben-Gurion would beg to be the chief rabbi. He wasn't exactly the model yeshiva boy, David Ben-Gurion. And I remember hearing the story, and I, there are pictures of Rabbi Yosef Mashash hugging David Ben-Gurion, and, you know, standing up for him when he came into the room, and walking him out of his office. David Ben-Gurion, when Rabbi Yosef Mashash used to come to him, David Ben-Gurion would escort him out of the building. That's how high stature he thought of him. I grew up in a yeshiva where they told me one story about David Ben-Gurion. The story of the Chazon Ish and David Ben-Gurion. Do you know the story? I'm going to tell it to you. Next time you meet someone with a black hat, tell them the story. They'll think you're in the inn. You know, it's like a, everyone knows the story. The Chazon Ish once, Nebuch, Lo Aleinu, had to meet David Ben-Gurion. The Chazon Ish was like the big rabbi of Bnei Brak, of the Haredi community. A very special tzaddik, but not exactly a Zionist in his nature. He wasn't What? He wasn't black. What does that mean? I read that he was a big tzaddik, but... What does it mean not a rabbi? Chavot Chaim didn't have smicha either. Meaning, smicha wasn't necessarily what. You're right, maybe he didn't have a paper. I don't know if he didn't have a paper. And some of us have papers, we don't know what they're worth. So, he didn't have a paper, but he was worth a lot. You know, so, there's a famous story David Ben Gurion had to meet. And the whole time he did like this. He looked down. And when David Ben Gurion left, he shook his hand like this and he left. And the famous words, he asked his students, his students asked him, why, why didn't you lift your head? So the rabbis tell us that it's forbidden to look in the face of an evil man. So the whole time I was with him, I didn't want to look in his face. I speak to him, I had to speak to him. 
but I couldn't look at his face for fear of what it would do to me. <laughs> See, when I... <laughs> the thing is like this, the Chazon Ish, most Jewish libraries have volumes of the Chazon Ish in there. And when I'm Bitochon, a special book, I have it on my shelf too. The back of the Mishnah Bua, we all have the Chazon Ish, look. The back of the Mishnah Bua, we all have Chazon Ish. But how many of us have a book of Rabbi Yosef Mashash? Who I think around this table more is in touch with our world view. And I'm telling you all of this for a reason. Is that right now we're part of a very interesting campaign to edit out a certain voice out of San Diego. Not mine. It's not my Jewish voice. It's our Jewish voice. It's your Jewish voice. We're doing something that hasn't been done before. And it hasn't been done before, not just on a Sephardic level, because to tell you the truth, I went to Israel and I came back that I don't even care if this community is called a Sephardic community anymore, it just needs to be a community. I, it's good for Sephardim, it's good for Ashkenazim, it's good for Chassidim, it's good for whoever wants to be a part of it. My wife and I, since we got here, have tried to have one goal in mind, and that is to come to the table, learn to our people, without an agenda. The only agenda should be to empower you to know enough that you can make your own decisions. To have Jewish texts in front of you. To know that there's Rav Kook's opinion, and there's Rav Uziel's opinion, and I'm not telling you which opinion is right. You should make that decision. You should research Rav Uziel, you should research Rav Kook. You come to that decision, regardless of the decision you come to, you're welcome in this community. Nobody, nobody has ever sat at my table and heard from me like, oh, you, you would be more religious if you finally put on a suit on Shabbat. What does a suit have to do with being religious? Tell me. Moshe Rabbeinu didn't wear a suit. Here I'm stuck, wishing I was Moshe Rabbeinu. Didn't have to wear one. It's, it's a... We... We can fall apart. <laughs> we wear robes and turbans yeah, and they sandals. Have, yeah? They don't sell them like that. <laughs> <laughs> but the truth is like this. People are very afraid of one thing. And that is allowing this community to be empowered. Allowing people to learn Torah. What sets us aside is not the way we pray on Shabbat. I love the way we pray on Shabbat. But I will name you a dozen communities across America that have nice tunes, they have a chazan built into the community and a huge building with a gold Aaron Kodesh and all kinds of things like that. That's not what's going to make us different. What's going to make us different is our ability to create a place where we learn Torah. And we don't just learn Torah, but we live Torah. And we let people know that there are many options in being Jewish. There's not just one road. There's not just one path. If you want to be a chassid and come in with a long coat and a hat or a strimal, you're welcome. And if you want to come in and, and, I don't know, with a rainbow tie-dye talit, and, you're welcome. And if you want to come in without a keep on your head, you're also welcome. Because we here, we here have an agenda, and the agenda is, we're sick and tired of this model of the way Judaism works until now. We don't like something, we edit it out and ignore that it ever happened. There are valid Jewish models in the world, there are valid Jewish opinions, and we're going to learn about them here. And I'm asking you one thing, I'm not, this is not an appeal, God forbid, for money, I never deal with money in the I'm asking you that as people, regardless of what community you're a part of, this community has two halves too. It has our Bet Knesset on Shabbat, and many of you pray here on Shabbat, and many of you don't. Many of you have your own communities where you're comfortable, that you pray with, and you have friends there, and you have never in your life heard from me that you shouldn't belong to another community. I know other rabbis have that thing, that, oh, you should move here, oh, you should never go there. We don't do that here. But we have another half of this community, and that's a chance to bring to San Diego a level of intellectual learning, of open-mindedness, of, of Jewish thought that has never been brought here before. And that's because of you. That's because for the first time in this town's history, you have a group of people that if you look across the table from each other, not all of you agree with each other's worldviews. Not all of you raise your families the same way. Not all of you think the same way. But all of you are part of something special because you're intelligent people. You are very good at what you do in your day-to-day -day life. You are academically intellectual people, advanced people. And when you come around this table, I just want to share with you as much Jewish knowledge as I possibly can. On the same level, they would be teaching it in a kolo anywhere else across the country. And we've been very successful. And that's why we're being threatened. That's why we're trying to be edited out. And I'm asking you, don't let it happen. Be involved. Be a part of this. If it was hard for you to come to kolo before, make sure that you come to kolo all the time now. We, we need it. We, and not just we need it, but you need it. I'm being presumptuous. You need it, and your kids need it, and this community needs it. Because you are going to be the group that will save this community. Not University City. San Diego. America. The world. Yeah, think big. And Bezant Hashem, give us the bracha that we will be successful. 
we will be successful. Because when you learn Torah, when you're connected to Kadosh Baruch in an intellectual fashion, not because I'm just doing what everyone else does, but I know. When you come around the Shabbat table and someone brings up a topic, and, hey, I've learned about that before, or I've heard about that, or I know more about it than you do, so, you know, don't mess with me. Whatever it would be that you're going to bring up, you're part of this discussion. Like I spoke about on Shabbat, that Moshe Rabbeinu started, and we're still having it. And I'm asking you, be a part of it. Be a part of it, Bezat Shabbat.